all regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad to have you with me on the program today. We've got another two for for you, uh, just like we did on Tuesday. We've got uh, multiple guests. Let me know if you like that, by the way. You know, I, I, it's easier for me to, uh, to, to cover than to write up. Uh, my uh, daily uh, post about Cam and Company when it's a single topic show, but there's just so much going on these days that uh, I want to make sure we get to as many guests as we possibly can. So uh, if you like the multiple guests, let me know. We'll, uh, we'll try to do this more often. So today we're going to be talking with uh, Rob Dorr from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus and uh, David Trayan from the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine. So the legislative sessions are still ongoing in both of these states. Most of the, in fact, all of the gun control bills have been dealt with in Maine. Uh, but there are still several bills that are a live threat to gun owners in the uh, land of 10,000 lakes. Uh, we'll start there with our conversation with Rob Dorr from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Take a look and a listen. Rob, thanks so much for coming to the program, sir. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Cam. Always a pleasure. So, so first of all, where are we in the legislative session here? We're getting towards the tail end, right? Yeah, actually, in just about an hour, uh, uh, which is why I'm in the car instead of the office, uh, we've got up at the uh, uh, down in, at the Capitol here, we've got the uh, ban on binary triggers coming forward. Uh, that's in response to uh, an attack on law enforcement officers and public safety uh, personnel that was done using a binary trigger. So, of course, the reaction is uh, we need to ban it immediately. OK, uh, what are then we have we have two other bills uh, that have passed the House uh, that have not yet seen action on the Senate floor. Uh, those are the mandatory reporting of lost or stolen firearms and then the government mandated storage of firearms, which, which dictates how you have to store firearms in your home. OK, so those are the, the three primary bills that, that you all are still concerned about. Um, wasn't there there was a gun ban bill, right? Wasn't there a quote unquote a Sullivan's ban that uh, was floating around the legislature this year? Yeah, there, there, there's been a lot of things that have been floating around assault weapons bans, mandatory licensing and mandatory insurance, um, uh, greatly limiting the Minnesota's permit to carry. We've been able to kill all of those off in the committee process. Okay. These are the ones that, that have been able to get enough steam to to uh, pass the House floor. And now now the action is in the Senate where there's a one vote majority. Yeah. And that one vote majority is a little hinky right now. Um, you and I don't think have spoken since uh, Senator Nicole Mitchell was arrested uh, and charged with burglary in her uh, stepmother's home. Um, she released her statement on Facebook, uh, which completely diverged from the police report. According to the police report, she was uh, uh, her stepmother discovered her uh, like right next to her bed, basically in the middle of the night. She ran down to the basement. She's dressed all in black. She's got a sock over her flashlight. Uh, there was a backpack stuck at a window that she was apparently trying to get out. And inside there was a laptop that uh, stepmother says was hers. Nicole Mitchell says it was actually uh, donated to her or given to her a couple of years ago. And then on Facebook, this becomes a question. Well, I was concerned about the mental health of this uh, family member. And so I went there and she's got dementia and Rob, what the hell, man? I mean, so so the the DFL caucus said, OK, you can't participate in caucus meetings. You can't participate in committee hearings, but you can still cast votes on the Senate floor. Right. We're not going to we're not going to remove you from office uh, here. There's also been well, an that's ethics. Just a bit. Yeah. And, and now. Yeah. And now they just had the ethics committee where they could not even find probable cause to conduct an investigation. There was enough probable cause, apparently, to remove her from her committee assignments. There's enough probable cause uh, to eject her from caucus meetings, but somehow not enough probable cause for the committee to even investigate. And we're not even talking about coming up to a determination. They voted down the the ability to just investigate any potential Senate ethics violations. It's a, it's a goat rodeo. It's utterly ridiculous. And it it is just fascinating to me that today in just a couple hours, uh, if gun control passes, it will be because a uh, alleged felon uh, is voting to pass gun control in the Minnesota Senate. That really is amazing. Um, I, I mean, how concerned are you now that we're going to see, you know, gangs of uh, senators breaking into homes now without fear of consequence from their colleagues? Yeah, uh, I think, it was uh, a little know, tug in cheek, but uh, I mean, my God, that is amazing. You say it's tongue in cheek, but there were uh, there was actually efforts to rename the uh, safe storage bill uh, to the Nicole Mitchell uh, yeah. bill because, it, you know, it's a, it's a uh, career hazard, I guess, for senators who are breaking into people's homes to for then those people to have easy access to firearms for self-defense. 
I yeah, I guess so. I I mean, as that's just it's unreal to me. Uh, it, it, seeing the not just the arrest itself, but then the 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 um, rear covering by the uh, DFL to make sure that whatever happens, they've got that vote there. So, do you think it is going to come down to Senator Mitchell? I know that you've spoken before about a couple of um, more rural state senators who have been at least non-committal about some of these bills. Where do you think things stand right now? Yeah, we've been putting on a lot of pressure on a, a few of the state senators who are Democrats but live in pro-gun districts, districts that have been traditionally pro-Second Amendment. Uh, we're pretty confident that um, the the safe storage mandate and even the mandatory reporting are, are probably not going to go through. Uh, the fact that they called this binary trigger ban, which which is a little bit more difficult, it actually three Republican uh, House representatives peeled off and voted with the Democrats uh, in the House for this bill because, you know, in the wake of a tragedy like this, you you got those moderate Republicans who think that they're going to get attacked. Uh, I just try to hammer into them that no matter what you do, it is not good enough. As long as you support any Second Amendment right, Moms Demand Action, Bloomberg, every town, they're all going to come after you, uh, no, regardless of how much you try to thread that needle. So why even bother giving them the, you know, any breath at all? Uh, it's not going to help you in your election. And, and, and I've been proven right time and time again here in Minnesota. Um, so why you have been uh, fighting against these gun control bills, I also, um, I don't spend a lot of time on social media, but uh, the other day I, I was on X and uh, I saw this group, uh, 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 Minnesota Gun Rights, uh, which is part of the the Door Brothers network of uh, uh, groups. Um, and they were going after the Minnesota Gun Caucus, calling you liberals, calling you squishes, saying that you're, you know, all in favor of gun control. What, what's going on there, Rob? Yeah, it's just the latest barrage and attack uh, for, from that the group that's had for 11 years. Anybody who's familiar with the Door Brothers, and I do want to distinguish, I'm D-O-A-R. <laughs> the good gun guy ends in A-R. Just remember that. They're D-O-R-R. Uh, but uh, the uh, they, they do this in every single state that they operate. So if, you, if you're listening out there in Ohio, you've seen them do this against the Buckeye Firearms Association. If you're out there in Georgia, you've seen them uh, do this against Georgia Carry or Georgia 2A. Uh, it, it, you know, if you're in Iowa, you've seen seen them do this against the Iowa Firearms Coalition. Every legitimate established gun group that has been working for decades gets attacked by them. And the reason only is because they want your they want their supporters and their donations. So the, what you have to do is take a clip post it wildly out of context and try to separate uh, the the supporters from the groups that they've traditionally established because it plays into their fantasies, you know, our supporters fantasies that there's some conspiracy that that the Republicans are working to undermine their rights and they're using us and it's all a big sham. I would just challenge anybody who believes any of the garbage that they're putting out there to just go look at the record itself. You'll see that I've testified against these bills four times in committees. You'll see uh, that I do weekly radio interviews where I've been uh, opposing these, this legislation. I've uh, written uh, talking points for our legislators. And then if you don't believe me, just call the legislators themselves and say, hey, who do you work with at the state capitol? Who do you trust when it comes to Second Amendment issues? And do this in your state. And I guarantee you, it's not going to be any of those jokers. Yeah, you know, and I, I'll be honest with you. I try to stay away from... Uh... Yeah, listen, there, there, there's a lot of clickishness within the 2A community, and I try to be a, you know, big tent. I'm the, the guy who sits at the yeah. table with the jocks and the uh, the nerds and the, uh, you know, drama, uh, whatever. Um, but this does bother me because particularly now in this post brune environment, uh, when we are seeing, you know, everything but the kitchen sink thrown up against the wall in an attempt to go after our segment and rights. One of the things that I've actually been pleased to see is the coalition building that's been taking place among Second Amendment groups that haven't always worked well together. Um, and you've got yeah. efforts from gun owners who are uh, trying to strengthen those bonds and strengthen those ties. And so when a group primarily tries to promote itself by attacking other two a groups, um, I have an issue with that, you know, and well, we can. Yeah. Well well, here's the case in point with that. Right now, today, we have a Senate vote that's going to uh, potentially pass gun control. Pending any day now, we have 11 days left of session. Any day now, we're going to get uh, potentially votes on gun control bills that will pass the Minnesota Senate, hit Governor Tim Walz's desk, who, who couldn't move fast enough to sign it. 
uh, Minnesota Gun Rights is running ads against the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus right now. They're not running any ads to try to stop these bills uh, from going through. And, and that's just what has to make you costly. What is their real motivation here? We we have a potential here to stop bad gun control bills from becoming law. And they're they're spending your don their you know not your donors, I, <laughs> but uh, their donors money attacking us instead. Yeah. So what what? Um, what should Minnesota gun owners be doing right now uh, with 11 days left in the session? Yeah, so right now, uh, it is important if you live in Minnesota, call your state representative and your state senator uh, and let them know you oppose this, the, the, any of these bills that are going through. We have all of the talking points and everything available on our guns, uh, our website, gunowners.mn slash action. We'll actually, you put in your address there, we'll, we'll, we'll give you all the information. We'll have a contact form for your senator. You'll have a, their phone number there so that you can follow up with a call to their office. Um, and, and then we have some information about some of these key senators who you should also be contacting Senator Grant Housechild up in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota. We've got Senator Rob Kupak, Judy Seberger, and telling them that, that it's important that they also oppose this legislation. All right. Listen, we'll let you get to the Capitol. I know you got a busy day ahead of you, but uh, I hope that we can touch it at base again in the next few days. I'd love to have you back on again before the end of the session. I'd love to come back with good news, Cam. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for everything you do. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. My thanks to Rob for joining us on the program. And uh, again, if you are a Minnesota gun owner, please make sure you are talking to your state representative, state senators right now in the uh, waning days of the session. Sounds like we've got a, a real chance to defeat uh, the vast majority of these bills. And I'm glad that uh, already some of the worst offenders uh, have died in committee. But um, again, the session is not over yet and there's still more work to be done. Now, in Maine, the talk has shifted from lobbying the governor and lawmakers to oppose gun control legislation to litigating um, one of the gun control bills that uh, Governor Janet Mills has allowed to become law. That's the 72-hour waiting period bill in Maine. Uh, earlier in the week, I wrote at uh, BarionArms.com the Kittery Trading Post, which is probably, I think it's without a doubt, the biggest independent gun store in the state of Maine. Um, they're talking about moving their firearms operations out of state and across the border into New Hampshire because of the impact that this waiting period bill is going to have on their ability to do business in the state. Um, David Trahan has an update on the uh, efforts to uh, sue over the impending 72-hour waiting period. And Kerry Trading Post actually comes up. Take a look and listen. David, thanks so much for coming to the program today. It's good to see you again, sir. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So the last time we talked, it was right after Governor Mills allowed this uh, three-day waiting period to be to become law without her signature. Um, one of the things that you said at the time was that, uh, and you've repeated this, I've seen your uh, comments in the local media there in Maine, that litigation is coming, right? So where are we on that? Sure. Well, I told the governor months ago, right after the Lewiston shooting, we cared about this issue, that waiting periods would have a detrimental impact on, on businesses, on our rights, just across the board, all kinds of problems for us. And it was a big deal. And I made it very clear. I, I made it public. And sure enough, uh, after we thought that this bill would go nowhere and that it might even be vetoed by the governor, that was all indications from the governor was that she didn't support the bill. Then she let it go into law. So we don't at our organization, the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, we don't threaten. When we tell people we're going to do something, we do it. And so within 12 hours, we met with our partners at Gun Owners of Maine, the National Rifle Association and Women for Gun Rights. And swiftly, we all agreed we needed to challenge this thing. Uh, so we did. You know, we reached out to attorneys. We started raising money. Uh, that's going well. Uh, the attorneys advised us that we had a we had a really good um, case. Kittery Trading Post contacted us and said, "We want to do everything in our power to challenge this thing." And so they've joined our coalition. We're talking with the Main Guides Association. They're going to take a vote very soon whether to join us or not. But we. Our coalition is growing. The momentum across the state is amazing. Uh, people are very upset. They didn't see this coming. And uh, we feel good about the case. But yes, we are bringing a lawsuit. We're still you know, working out the details. Sure. 
Yeah. So anyway, well, I mean, um, the, the timing of this, you know, uh, you, you have to wait until the issue is ripe. Um, mm -hmm. And so if folks are wondering, well, why hasn't this also been filed yet? Um, it, it, it takes time. And we had a case out of New York challenging the uh, post one of the post Bruin laws that was originally dismissed because the law hadn't taken effect yet. Um, so do we know when this waiting period law will actually take effect? Yes, it takes effect 90 days after what is called sign or die. Okay. When the legislature, well, yeah, when the legislature ends its session, uh, 90 days later, later, the laws that did not receive an emergency preamble uh, become law. So it'll be early August. Uh, I expect sign or die to be either Friday or Monday. So 90 days from that date, uh, this law will become effective. And so we are still strategizing because of what you mentioned. We don't want to file too early or too late, but we also don't want companies like Kittery Trading Post to leave our state. And given the in, their indications, they're going to lose about $2 million a year from, yeah, 60% of their business because they're so close to the border mm -hmm. with New Hampshire. They already have an issue with New Hampshire because there's a sales tax exemption in New Hampshire. So you just jump over the border into Maine, and now you're going to have a three-day waiting period and a sales tax exemption next door. So Kittery Trading Post, being a good business, they're going to do what they have to to survive. I, you know, I wrote about this through. a couple of days ago. Yeah, they're talking about moving their firearms operation across the border yeah. into New Hampshire, right? Taking that uh, yeah. revenue away from the state of Maine and, and those jobs, too. Uh, yeah. I'm... I got to say, I'm really glad to hear that uh, that they are interested in joining the coalition. That you've got other groups like the uh, guides in Maine that are also talking about this because, yeah. you know, this is a big tent issue, right? I mean, this is going to impact every gun owner in the state of Maine at some point. Um, yeah. So while you all are strategizing, while you're getting your legal ducks in a row, what can gun owners do to support this? If if we want to. Obviously, I can't litigate, but, you know, I could send you a couple yeah. of bucks, maybe. How do I how do I yeah. do that, David? <laughs> yes, you can. You can join our efforts. And I would say to your listeners, you're listening to this show because you care about your Second Amendment rights or you wouldn't be listening. This is your opportunity. Uh, our efforts are from the grassroots. None of our organizations are so-called rich. We're going to have to raise a lot of money. We're going to have to have membership. Anybody that would like to join the effort can go to the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine website. Um, you can just quick Google uh, samofmaine.org, sportsmansallianceofmaine.org will get you to our website. There, We set up a, a donation button there. You can click on it, make a donation. What I'd say to your listeners is your economic means every dollar counts. A show like yours can reach across the nation. Putting all of our efforts together, whether it's a $10 donation or a $1,000 donation, they all make a difference. So if you listen, this is your opportunity to push back. The, the case in Maine is unique in that our law is very broad. It Because of the way our state is set up, uh, being a tourist economy, the uh, New Hampshire issue with sales tax, it's relatively not easy, but for our litigators there for Maine and because of the way our law is and way way our state is is situated, we can show standing that there will be damage from this law. Now, the economic damage to business is one thing, but I would I would say to your listeners, what other constitutional right do you have to get permission from the government to exercise in three days? Right. If you said to a reporter, you can't do a story for three days until the government approves it. I think most media outlets would tell you where to put that. And rightly so. And the uproar would be thunderous. And that's true of all of our rights. We are born with them. Um, I, unless we fight for them, we're going to lose them. This is an opportunity for your listeners to make a difference, for people in Maine to make a difference. This law is lousy. It's unconstitutional. It is duplicative of a Nick's background check. Imagine this, too. Here I go to try to buy a firearm. The state supplies information to the Nick system. 
the government collects that information and in that background check clears you to buy a firearm. So now I have to wait three more days, even though I've been cleared to buy the firearm. For what purpose? Right. Because so the that, government knows better, right? That that's 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 yeah, why. Um, because uh, you know, yeah. uh, and again, we've we've heard these arguments. This is going to reduce suicide. This is uh, going to you know prevent uh, impulsive acts. Um, I know you care deeply uh, about mental health, David. Uh, I know that you were when we first spoke after Lewiston. Um, you actually praised the governor for wanting to expand mental health uh, availability across the state of Maine, and that's that's a good thing. Um, yeah, but but treating every would be gun owner as if they're a dangerous person, um, that I, I think is offensive to our constitutional rights. You know, it's we can be concerned that. about mental health. We can be concerned about suicide, but that doesn't mean that we get to trample on people's yes. civil liberties. It's a scarlet letter for our community. It's about demonizing guns. The same group that pushed the waiting period pushed a uh a, a firearm destruction law. Mm -hmm. They wanted every firearm in, in law enforcement custody to be destroyed, whether it was used in a game violation or in a robbery. That was symbolic. They, they want to create the image in the public that every gun is bad and every gun needs to be destroyed. If they can create barriers to gun shows, which this law is, I can't imagine gun shows being able to operate. And there are lots of them in our state. They're done. Yeah. Many of them are done by fishing game clubs in a one or two day gun show. And they use those funds from the gun show to teach kids about gun safety. Ironically, those gun shows are over. If you live, if you're, if you're guiding in Northern Maine and you have a client from out of state, that client's likely to stop at Cabela's, LL Bean, Kittery Trading Post, maybe buy a firearm, maybe buy a whole bunch of other gear. Now they're going to do their shopping at, say, in New Hampshire mm -hmm. before they even get it because they're not going to deal with the waiting period. They're not going to deal with the extra sales tax. You talk about a death blow to the outdoor community. This is it. It will have ripple effects across our state. And it'll also open the door to what Michael Bloomberg likes to do in other states, he once he he takes down your defenses, he he breaks through your barrier, your Second Amendment advocacy groups and gets a law passed. The floodgates open and the next year he comes pouring in with a bunch more. We were already hearing it. They're already saying now that they're coming back next year for full blown red flag. I will guarantee you that will be 20 or 25 gun control bills in the legislature next year. So we have to show a robust opposition, challenge this every inch of the way, give up our ground real slow. If they're going to take ground here in Maine, they're going to have to fight for it. And that's what this effort's going to be about is pushing back. It's bad policy. It hurts our communities. It robs you of your freedom. And we're not going to stand for it. So again, I, I ask your, your listeners to consider helping us. Uh, go to the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine website samofmaine.org and make a donation online uh, do what you can um, we've been pleasantly surprised by the early days uh, people have joined in we're not going to talk about actual numbers what we've raised because we don't want uh, folks on the other side to to uh, to know that information but sure but help us help us we're going to push back and and you know add your name to the effort and we'll see if we can't win this thing in court. Imagine the ripple effect, Cam. If this is successful for all the other states in the United States that have waiting periods, you're going to have protection now. You're going to have constitutional precedent. And Bruins and the Bruin case is going to be measured against this bill. And if the courts say, no, this is unconstitutional, which I believe they will, it's going to help your state. Absolutely. Um, well, listen, uh, again, I would encourage folks to uh, visit the uh, Sportsman's Alliance main website, do what you can. Um, again, there's a lot of litigation going on around the country, but uh, this case matters. All of these cases matter. And it doesn't matter if you live in a pro-gun state, a deep blue anti-gun state, 
Um, this fight is coming to your doorstep sooner or later. And uh, again, if you live in a blue state, likely sooner rather than later. Uh, David, we are going to keep following up with you, if you don't mind. So, uh, you know, we, we look forward to welcoming you back. We can uh, talk again in a few weeks and get an update. Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely want to uh, stay in touch and keep people up to date on what's going on with the legal efforts here. Sure. I appreciate that. I want to leave your listeners with one last thought why this matters and why it, it's life and death. When we, when we had our tragic Lewiston shooting, 18 people um, were shot and killed. The shooter, Robert Card, was on the loose. I believe he was on the loose for five days. The obvious uh, facts are coming out that the government failed us at every level, mm -hmm. whether it was the police officers, whether it was the military. This was a failure of the very people we're giving our rights up to. While Robert Card was on the loose with a firearm, unstable, after the government failed, this law would require that those who were cowering in their homes in fear would have to wait three days to protect their family. That empowers the criminal, the murderer. And that's why we have to stand up to this. Why would we give up our safety and freedom when the government failed us? And with Absolutely. that, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity. Well, David, thank you again. And you're absolutely spot on uh, to bring that up. I, I really appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you again very soon, sir. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. My thanks again to David for being on the program. And uh, we will be checking in with him and Rob Dorr uh, here in the coming days as well. All right. In the interest of time, um, we will skip today's uh, recidivist report and our good deed of the day. You'll have to find your good news somewhere else. But, well, I mean, we do have some good news because we have an armed citizen story to talk about. Uh, this one out of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, Horsham Township, PA, to be specific, where uh, burglars... Did a pretty professional job of breaking into a, a jewelry shop, but they forgot to account for the possibility that there would be an armed citizen inside. Yeah, uh, it was about four, well, before 5 a.m. at the uh, shops at English Village in Horsham Township. Police say the suspects broke the lock at a massage envy store, entered that building and then cut a hole through the wall. So they could go into a, a business called Waxing the City, which, ouch. Um, then they cut through another wall to gain entrance into the jewelry shop. Vicky Lombardo of Waxing the City says they knew what they were doing. I think this was all planned out. She says she woke up to a phone call from the Horsham police saying that the jewelry store got robbed and they wanted her to come down to the scene because she was the only emergency contact that they had. Now, according to uh, ABC uh, Channel 6 in Philadelphia, once the burglars got inside the jewelry store, police say their plans were thwarted when the store's owner showed up and shot one of the male suspects who was inside. The suspect was shot in the arm. He was still there on the scene when police arrived, taken to the hospital. Detectives are coming through the store where they say workers are still taking inventory to see what, if anything, is missing. Uh, other suspects are believed to have been involved in this burglary. They have not been accounted for. Uh, but again, the uh, jewelry store owner who showed up on scene uh, did shoot one of the suspected intruders. Uh, 6 ABC says it's unclear at this point how the other suspects got away. They also say it's not the first time the store has been targeted. I I don't know if they've been able to cut through the uh, the walls before. But uh, yeah, this 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 was well thought out. Just forgot about that whole right to keep and bear arms thing. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of Barrett Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program. As always, I'm looking forward to being back with you again with another show on Monday. But don't forget to check out BarrettArms.com between now and then. We are keeping the website up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment information from all across the nation. We are fighting media misinformation, recovering litigation, legislation, regulations, any other shuns that uh, you can think of. We've got it covered there at BarrettArms.com. And if you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a V VIP or VIP Gold member. Use the promo code Save America, and you can get 50% off of your VIP or VIP Gold membership. You're going to get exclusive content. You're going to get an ad-free experience. You're going to get other perks and bennies, but you will also be supporting the independent pro Second Amendment journalism that we're doing at VarianArms.com. And I thank you for that, because in this day and age of media misinformation and big tech censorship, your support is more important than ever. So thank you again. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday. Until then, be well. Be safe and be free.